So this video is going to be a little bit more off the cuff than usual. Uh, Johnny D won't be doing any videos with me anymore, so I'm going solo. And this will be my first time trying to get my video setup working. Now that I'm going solo, I won't be able to do a recap every week like I did before because it'll take me more time to make them. Don't panic though, because I'll try to do them every other week instead. And I might make a few more videos that are a bit more off the cuff, like this one. I thought it was important to cover this topic because I've seen two things lately. I've seen people completely unwilling to talk about it because they think that they're going to fall into a trap if they do, and I've seen people actually fall into a trap while discussing it because the way that the media talks about it is so full of falsehoods that the people who are actually associated with the Consumer Revolt are starting to repeat those falsehoods. So this is going to be about one of the events that started this all off, one of the events that uh, kicked everything into high gear, and probably the reason why we're all here today. This is about the Nathan Grayson incident. I see a lot of people tend to call this the Zoe Quinn scandal, but I like to call it the Nathan Grayson incident because Grayson is really the one who was at fault here. What I'm hoping that you take away from this is that you shouldn't be afraid to discuss this incident. You shouldn't be scared to talk about it. As a matter of fact, you should talk about it. Just make sure that you have all your facts in order before you do. Make sure that you know what you're talking about. And hopefully after you're done with this video, you'll have enough information to know exactly what you're talking about. Let me first go over the lie that the media is telling. This is repeated in article after article, in tweet after tweet, in post after post, and by now, I'm starting to see the pattern. The pattern is that what the media says is the consumer revolt started over allegations that Nathan Grayson received sex in exchange for him writing good reviews, which has since been debunked. Now, the problem with this is that's not true at all. It's easy to debunk that because it's not true, but that was never a claim that was actually made by the consumer revolt. Now, I have heard Consumer Revolt participants parrot this, but it's mostly because they're new to the revolt and they got their information on this incident from the media, which is reporting on it falsely. Let's dismantle this claim that we've always said that Nathan Grayson is trading sex for positive reviews. The issue with that is Nathan Grayson didn't do that, but the catch is the Consumer Revolt at the start didn't make that claim. You can go watch Internet Aristocrat's original videos on the topic, and he doesn't make that claim. He clearly states that it was coverage, not a review. And not only that, but he actually goes and t shows the coverage that was given right in his video. So the second part of that, saying that the sex was in exchange for something, in, usually a review, but uh, it doesn't matter in this case because the issue is is that the relationship did not turn romantic until after the coverage was given. Uh, this misconception is due to a typo in the original publication of the Zoe post, which made it look like Nathan Grayson and Zoe's relationship started earlier than it actually did. Uh, Aaron Joni, the author of the Zoe post, did go back and make that correction which demonstrates to me that he was operating in good faith. I should disclose, however, that I do have a financial relationship with Aaron Joni. I gave less than $20 towards one of his filing fees uh, for legal costs. So as the facts stand, it demonstrates why the media claim is false. Yes, the idea that sex was traded for reviews is false. However, that claim was not ever made. There was a claim that sex was traded for coverage, which was then later revised once more information came to light, once the Zoe post was corrected. First of all, let's get into why it's just as bad, even though it is just coverage and not a review. It doesn't actually change the fact that it was journalistic impropriety, or potential journalistic impropriety, that it was just coverage and not a review. The first article that everyone likes to talk about was this article written by Nathan Grayson and published inside Rock Paper Shotgun. At first glance, it might seem pretty innocuous. I mean, he's just listing off 50 games that are greenlit on Steam. It sounds pretty minor if one of those was a game by his friend, right? The issue is, is that it's not just a list of 50 games. He clearly has Depression Quest on the mind. If you look at the article, the title of the article is a pun off of the name of Depression Quest. The article's name is Admission Quest. Valve greenlights 50 more games. 
If you look at the article even further, you'll notice that the one and only screenshot, the one used as the header image, is of Depression Quest. And not only that, he mentions three games in particular that are standouts. The first standout that he mentions, the powerful Twine Darling, is Depression Quest. So clearly, out of those 50 games, one game in particular is given preferential coverage. The other article that's always mentioned, uh, this one was even mentioned in Internet Aristocrats video as well, is a article that was published in the TMI section on Kotaku. It's called The Indie Game Reality TV Show That Went to Hell, and it's also written by Nathan Grayson. It's about that failed game jam, the one that Polaris spent $400,000 on in order to produce it, that was also sponsored by Pepsi Mountain Dew. So this article uh, quotes Nathan Grayson's friend and future lover as a source extensively. In fact, it uses her as one of four primary sources that I could find. So this is an event that was expensive and that failed and that caused someone to lose their job. And the coverage that we have on it is one-fourth dirty sourced at least. And actually, it's more than one-fourth dirty sourced because another one of the participants in the game jam that's used as a primary source was in a romantic relationship with Zoe Quinn as well. So if a specific narrative was trying to be pushed, that means that half of the sources are questionable. The issue here is that we don't quite know what actually went down at this game jam, and it's not possible for us to tell if Nathan Grayson's coverage of the incident was biased by the set of relationships that existed between the people involved. And since it's not possible to know this, then that creates the perception of a conflict of interest. Now, here's the thing. We can't tell if Nathan Grayson was influenced or not, but that actually doesn't matter when it comes to journalistic ethics. The fact that there's even a perceived conflict of interest is enough to make this a violation of journalistic ethics, according to the SBJ Code of Ethics. So let me fill in the last piece of the puzzle, because I'm sure some of you are wondering, where's the perceived conflict of interest? I mean, uh, Nathan Grayson and Zoe Quinn's relationship didn't turn romantic until after the articles were released. And trust me, it did turn romantic. Stephen Tutillo, editor-in-chief of Kotaku, actually confirmed this in an article that he wrote. The reason why this is a conflict of interest is there is evidence that Nathan Grayson and the developer of Depression Quest had a friendship, a friendship going back years. You can see this from their Twitter history, and you can also see this from the Zoe post, which Aaron Joni wrote. Not only that, but shortly before one of the articles was released, there was indications on Twitter that the two of them went on a trip to Vegas together. So let's put all these pieces together. These two people had a friendship going back years, and they'd been on a Vegas trip together. Nathan Grayson, who was the games journalist, had written multiple articles in which he mentions Depression Quest and the developer. So while there was no review, there was plenty of coverage. And from the very beginning, it was only claimed to be coverage. If you look at Internet Aristocrats videos, that confirms this. Even though there was no review, and there was no romantic relationship before the articles were written, this is still a friendship-based relationship, still coverage, and still potential journalistic impropriety. The relationships are absolutely confirmed to have turned romantic shortly after some of the articles were written. Stephen Totillo himself confirmed this. Not only that, but Nathan Grayson is listed in the credits for Depression Quest because he provided feedback to the game while it was in development. So there's another kind of relationship right there. So put all these puzzle pieces together and think about it, and think about why people would say that this starting event doesn't matter, why they would say that because there is no review, this starting event doesn't matter, or why they would say that because the relationship wasn't romantic before the articles, this event doesn't matter. I would say, to counter that, that this incident absolutely does matter, but you have to know the facts first. Once you know the facts, it becomes clear that there was something suspicious going on here, and the resulting censorship is what kicked off more research into suspicious practices in the gaming press. And what do you know? A lot more things have been found since, and a lot of them are considerably worse than this incident. So that makes it fascinating to me that those who wish to silence the consumer revolt keep bringing up this one incident over and over again. I think that there's two things at play there. First of all, I think that it's because this incident got the most coverage in the press. And second of all, I think that it's because that press coverage was so twisted that a lot of people have their facts wrong about it, or a lot of people are confused about what actually happened. 
This allows a certain style of argument to be made, an argument that says, well, the claims of the consumer revolt are false because the claims that they're making aren't backed by the facts. And not only that, the fact that their claims aren't backed by evidence means that it was clearly a hate campaign. This is how you can successfully spin a narrative of that the whole thing started in hate. So what I have to say to you is don't fall into that trap. Don't be afraid to discuss it, but when you discuss it, have all your facts together. The facts are on your side. The facts are on our side. And if you use those facts effectively, you can confirm that there's absolutely journalistic impropriety in this original event. And then you can go on to discuss the further journalistic impropriety that was found since. And that's a really important place to turn the conversation, is to point out that the things found since then are really, really bad. Some of the stuff that came out recently with uh, developers and publishers paying money into the Patreons of journalists and then those journalists covering their games or their companies is blatantly unethical. And there's practically no way to claim that there's no big deal there. So there you have it. That's why you shouldn't be afraid to discuss this incident. All you need to do when discussing this incident is have the facts on your side and stick strictly to the facts. You need to correct revisionist history when you see it, and you need to point out that this was just the first thing that was found, and that it was considerably milder than things that were found since. It was just an indicator that there were deep problems inside the gaming journalism industry. 